Fishu will um, lead us through a guided meditation. Um, unless people have Q&A right now, or we can do a Q&A after the meditation. Um, after the meditation. I found the switch switch. I I was just told this is the perfect time for me to come here because there's a whole um, the economic crisis is happening. <laughs> And students are very stressed out about the future. Please come, why don't you join us here? Come. <laughs> and I have two seats here vacant too. Come. Well, just imagine you have a car and it has no brakes. And you have your foot on your on the accelerator and you are driving. Can you just imagine? You don't know where how to stop the car. Though you want to go to a shopping center, you pass by, you can't stop the car. You keep running. A similar situation with our mind. We don't know where to stop, when to stop, how to stop. And taking that little break is what I would call meditation. So, uh, the MC has told me to start with meditation, then we talk. I think it's a good idea. What do you think? You know, meditation is not concentration for your information. If you think meditation is concentration, I would say, I'm sorry, that's not the meditation what I teach or I think is meditation. Meditation is a process and concentration is an outcome of it. If you meditate, and when you come out of meditation, you have focus of mind, you have concentration. So concentration or alertness is byproduct of meditation, not the process of meditation. Is that clear to everybody? Hmm? So we'll do a short meditation, a short relaxation, deep relaxation. And then we'll move on to Q&A. So, uh, let's all sit comfortably and easily. There are, there are seats, come, you can, you can be. If you can just move one seat and uh, this, this chair, you can, we can push it there. Come, come, come. Don't feel shy, come on. <laughs> Decorate the chairs and they... <clears throat> okay, so do you all have cell phones here? The protocol is the cell phone meditates first and then we follow. <laughs> so you have to take your cell phone and press that red button on the cell phone. Then we'll begin. Okay, let's close our eyes. Let's take a deep breath in and breathe out. <coughs> Let's become aware of the weight of our body. Whatever it is, 130 pounds, 150 pounds. Just recollect how much you weigh. We came into this planet weighing just four kilos or eight pounds. And today we weigh 150, 130 pounds. Let's take a deep breath in. Hold a breath. 
And as you breathe out, place your entire weight on the chair you are sitting. Let's bring our attention to our body. Our body is made up of billions of cells. And let's honor our own body. Feel our own body. Relax your shoulders, your arms, legs. Feel your own body. Let's take another deep breath in. Hold a breath and breathe out. Let's keep taking a couple of deep breaths. Another deep breath in. And breathe out. Incoming breath energizes the body, while outgoing breath brings relaxation. Let us become familiar with this phenomenon that's happening all the time. Incoming breath energizes the body, and as you breathe out, you find certain relaxation. Now, let's become aware of the air all around us. We take things for granted. We live in atmosphere. Like fish in the water, we are in air. What is water to the fish is air to us. Feel the air all around you, and as you breathe in, feel the air within your bo own body. With a deep breath in, and breathe out. As you breathe in, fresh energy comes into your body, and as you breathe out, all the tiredness leaves the body. Let's become aware of the thoughts that are coming in our mind just this moment. Pleasant thoughts, unpleasant thoughts, good thoughts, bad thoughts. Let them just come and go. Embrace them all. Now let's take a deep breath in with a big smile on our face. Never mind even if it's artificial. Breathe in with a smile. 
and breathe out with a smile. As we smile, all the muscles in our face gets relaxed. Our body is like the wig of a candle, the mind is like the glow all around the body. Let's take another deep breath in and slowly breathe out and relax your body more and more. Let every cell of your cell in your body start relaxing. As the body relaxes, the mind expands. Let it expand. This moment, we are not interested in knowing anything or doing anything. Simple relaxation. Let the mind expand and occupy this entire hall. As the mind expands, the body relaxes and vice versa. Let go all your efforts. Simply relax. Nothing to do right now other than relax more. Let's take our attention to the top of the head. And become aware of the empty space above your head. Now I'll chant Om. Om means unconditional love and universal peace. And let's spread the vibration of peace and love all around us.
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. You are peace. You are peace. Then slowly and gradually become aware of body and surroundings. <coughs> Let's take another deep breath in and breathe out. And at your own speed, you may open your eyes. Was it good? How many of you enjoyed the meditation? Tell me now. Is there anyone who could not meditate? Can you raise your hand? So pretty much everybody did, you know? So now I'm opening the floor for question and answer. Do you have some questions? You know, in, um, in India it is said, the first sign of intelligence is not to speak at all. Having lost that, the second sign of intelligence is not to say anything unless a question is asked. So almost all the books, all the scriptures, they begin with a question, including Bhagavad Gita. If someone asks a question, someone else has an answer. A Q&A, all the books are written in that fashion. So having lost the first sign of intelligence, I wouldn't like to lose the second one, having come to Wharton. <laughs> yes. Hi. I wanted to, uh, to understand when you meet people who hate each other, people who are at war, like in Iraq or in, in conflict zones. And it's success is already putting them together in the same room. What do you tell them to bring peace? I mean, what's, what's the process? You know, I just look at them. I don't tell them anything. I say, hey, come on, let's play. <laughs> what's the trouble? What's the problem with you? <laughs> do you see? Usually we don't touch into the, the sensitive areas what they, they are stuck at. So there are some areas that everybody can agree. So we move through that place. Like in the prisons we see in Kashmir and other places. Uh, there are people who are fanatics. You know, we, t we don't go into any controversy. We tell them, hey, come on, let's breathe and let's do some relaxation, some meditation. And, just that breathing makes the difference, you know, makes the shift. They start listening to you. They start realizing, you know, there's something, something in me, you know. So I say usually we convey, we, we normally we convey more through our presence than to our words. So that catches.
By the way, yesterday there was a bomb scare in uh, uh, in Karnataka in Bangalore. They said they are going to keep bomb. Uh, they have bomb. They have kept bombs in all the ashrams and temples. And they got an email. The police gets an email in the middle of the night. So they come to our place, our ashram, our campus also, and they found two bags in the middle of the night, at three o'clock in the morning. Mm. You see, that was something good. They kept the bomb and said, we have kept it and sent an email. <laughs> Uh, so my question is, if nobody guides us through the process, how can we do self-meditation without falling asleep? <laughs> you know, if you fall asleep, it doesn't matter during meditation. But when you wake up, sit again to meditate. Because your body needs that much of rest, you know, that little dose of rest. So. That's okay. Doing a few minutes of breathing before meditation would help you to be uh, more energetic and aware in meditation. Sometime of alternative nostril breathing, or some stretch also will help, you know, stretching your body, stretching your back, rolling your neck. Tell me, how many of you work with computers? Um, I mean, of course, everybody. Everyone here, but uh, after three, four hours of working with computers, your eye starts burning. Raise your hand. Okay, now I'm going to give you a technique which would just, you, you can snap up from that, okay? Snap out of it. Just hold your thumb underneath your eyebrows and your index finger above I'm holding the mic so you can do it with both both eyebrows. <laughs> and then gen gently press and uh, straighten your eyebrows. And then Take your thumb and roll it around your eyes. If you do this uh, once in every three, four years, just 30 seconds or one minute, you'll feel already better, you know, circulation improves. <laughs> It's just like if you're sitting for too long, your legs go to sleep and then you have to get up and walk a little bit and, or shake your legs and you improve the circulation, right? But we don't do anything uh, to the eyes. Though we give so much job to our eyes, we never do any exercise or anything that bring more circulation to our eyes, our optic nerves, isn't it? So this will help, you know, the eyebrows doing this. And then one more exercise. This will also come to you as handy. Do you know where the stress hide in your body? What is that? What is the first sign of stress? You lose your smile. And the stress hides in between your in between your jaws. So if you hold the three fingers and in between your jaws, do you see some knots there? Can you feel some knots? Hmm? So you are very naughty. <laughs> So you have to bring these knots all the way down, straighten them up. If you do like this, give a little massage to yourself on your cheeks. Your smile will be right back. Come, smile will come right back. Okay. These simple exercises, simple stretches, and some breathing exercise and meditation 
just elevate our spirit so much. <coughs> uh, two people means you mean husband and wife? <laughs> a boyfriend and a girlfriend? Any friends? No, there are different formula for different people. <laughs> it can't be same medicine for everybody. <clears throat> uh, if it's between boyfriend and girlfriend, I have some different suggestion. Is that what you want? <laughs> Never step on the emotion of a woman. And for, for girls, never step on the ego of a man. You know, your boyfriend may be dumb, <laughs> but you should never tell him <laughs> you are dumb. You know, the whole world may say he is a fool, you should always say, no, you are really brilliant. Just the fact that it, you don't use your brilliance doesn't mean you don't have it. <laughs> See, you, you, sh you should pump the ego of a man. And similarly, you should always pump the emotion, not step on the emotion of a woman. She wants to go for shopping, give your credit card. <laughs> And, you know, conflicts are bound to rise, especially among the intellect, intelligent people. If, they are, if everyone is like a sheep, then there is no conflict. They are all moving in the same direction. But more individualistic we are, we are bound to have differences. And conflicts bound to arise. But one thing, one advice would be, don't carry yesterday's conflict today. If you want to have conflict today, you start a fresh one. <laughs> I don't believe in carrying on the old stale conflicts and pointing out fingers, oh, hey, look, you did this thing to me yesterday or 10 days ago or 10 years ago. That makes it worse, right? When you, keep, when you create certain room for conflicts, you will sail over it. And if you ride on it, if you say, if you, you know, gallop on the conflicts, then it remains with you. Yes? You know, one thing, I never compare myself with anybody. I don't go on a comparison tour, first of all. Second is, I'm just myself. I'm natural, and the way, whatever I know, I just say it. You know, I'm not trying to make uh, uh, something out of it, you know. I just, I've never done anything that's not in my nature. So, I don't know why this is successful, why Art of Living has become the largest uh, that's for you to make a study, you know, I think... <laughs> I think some... Um, some the <coughs> University of Netherlands have made a research on that. I think we should... I have not read it myself. Somebody's PhD thesis. So... But one thing is for sure, the, the whole thing runs on uh, inspiration rather than motivation, you know? Do you see what I'm saying? People are inspired to take up projects and they, they come up uh, on their own to do things. Um, there is a difference between inspiration and motivation. Motivation is short-lived, but inspiration uh, that touches your heart and uh, it moves from that direction.
when things don't go the way you wanted it to go, what happens? You get frustrated, you know, you see. You know, you should have ten plans. If this doesn't work, you put the next one, then the other one, then the other one. So, the mo even before you take an action, you know if it doesn't work, then you have an alternative. Then you don't get frustrated. And of course, the technique does work, meditation and breathing. <laughs> it just lifts, uplifts your spirit immediately. Uh, I was wondering how you go around the world spreading <coughs> compassion. Um, I was wondering how when, when you see people who are really suffering uh, and you're empathizing with them, how you still manage to maintain such a, a peace of mind and tranquility while feeling their suffering. Uh, this is like asking a doctor, you know, you go into the hospital and there are so many sick people and how you still remain healthy. You can. Does it answer your question? Yes. Um, so when you're, when you're treating them, um, do, you, do you feel what they're feeling? You... Definitely, definitely. So On some level, yeah. And on that level, it doesn't really touch you. Okay. <laughs> That's a million dollar question. But you know, you should keep it with you. <laughs> One who knows will not tell you the answer. And anyone who tries to answer this question really doesn't know. So this question itself is very important because that will uh, help your journey. It's like a vehicle for you to go within, deep within, and ask, what's the purpose of life? What do I want? You know? It's a, it's a very good question. You should give a pat onto your back. Many don't even ask this question, what's the purpose of life? And they live the whole life. The fact this question comes into our mind, what is the purpose of life? What am I doing? What do I want? Shows uh, maturity in, in our intellect. intellect. Yeah? I leave that question with you and I would uh, encourage you to go deep in meditation. Okay? From what I understand, uh, many of you, or most of your teachings are... Uh, non-religious, um, but do you uh, associate yourself with a particular religion? Uh, I would say spirituality is the essence of all religion, where all religions meet. And uh, what we espouse is spirituality. Of course, I am born as a Hindu and I remain a Hindu. And, uh, religion is part of our life, but spirituality is something that is universal. It is, it's trans-religious. In fact, it is. It unites the principles of all religion. And that's what we need today, you know. We need to secularize our religion, socialize the business, and spiritualize the politics. What do you say? Um, what I've heard from my dad, Dr. Narendra Sahasrabhutteji, who considers you as his very good friend, that you virtually remember every person you meet, and you meet thousands of people literally every day. And how do you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> I think the scientists say we have billions of s neurons, billions of cells in our brain, so maybe many of them are active and sometimes. <laughs> What do you think causes stress, and what are some of the long-term solutions? Short, too much to do and too little time causes stress, doesn't it? Or you want too much, and you have very little time and less energy to achieve it. Then that causes you stress. So now here, either you extend your time, or you increase your energy. You can't extend your time. You can't have 25 hours in a day. It's only 24. Then the calendar slip, flips. So time is limited. But um, how do you manage now you have to increase your energy level in you? 
and that you can do through four sources, four sources of energy. Proper food, not too much, not too little. You know, uh, according to Ayurveda, the science of life, the right amount of food is when you hold your hand as a cup, how much food it fits in. Only that much food you, have, you can eat at one time. But don't ask me if there is no upper limit. <laughs> so that much food, that too, uh, more vegetable fruits, fresh fruits, less carbohydrate, more protein, less sugar, this type of food gives you energy. Proper food. And then proper sleep. Six to eight hours of sleep. Two so second source of energy. Third source of energy is breathing. The breath which we have completely ignored. We study about food. We study, we know that we need to have rest, we, we sleep. But we seldom take a few deep breaths or do any breathing exercises. So if you practice 10 minutes of breathing, different breathing exercises, there are a number of breathing uh, rhythms. You feel so energetic. You know, at the evening, 5 o'clock, you do a few breathing exercises. You feel as though you just woke up from your bed and you feel very fresh. So you can go on till 12, 1 in the night without getting tired. And then a few minutes of meditation. Meditation gives you enormous strength, enormous energy. Especially during exam time, you can just do away with just three, four hours of sleep. I need just three hours, three and a half hours of sleep. And you feel fresh and alert, not that you feel so drowsy and uh, blur, blur in your attention, in your mind. And it improves your attention span, retention power. As students, you need these two things, right? Attention and retention, correct? See, sometimes you sit through the lecture for a whole hour. At the end of it, you, you hardly grasp two, three minutes of what has been said. Isn't it? How many of you had this problem, right? <laughs> yeah. It seems the mind takes a coffee break, cappuccino break, every ten minutes, if not sooner. So, doing meditation, Sudarshan Kriya especially, improves the attention span. And it helps you to retain the, uh, what you have studied, retention power. And it keeps you cheerful throughout the day. And I tell you, no one else is going to make you cheerful. You are responsible to make yourself happy. What's the time, Abhi? It's one. So, one last question. Uh, this Don't be stuck in any concepts. You, if you have a concept about growth, try to see beyond your concept. Right? Create a sense of belongingness and your commitment to the purpose. The three essential ingredients, I would say. Thank you. First, on behalf of the entire Warden community, we would like to thank you so much, uh, Shishiki, for visiting the Warden School and for leading this inspiring uh, session. So thank you so much. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. 
Uh, your words are especially helpful to us as um, we go through this um, very important phase in our lives. Um, also, we would like to thank um, Kembrel Jones, the Leadership Lectures Committee, and for all the student volunteers for making this happen. Thank you so much. Um, I'll now hand it over to Pranav, um, who is the president of the India Club. Um, Guruji, your words have inspired uh, millions of people across the world, and I'm sure it's the case uh, today for us here too. Thanks a lot for being here. We are extremely honored to have you here in our midst. Uh, on behalf of the Wharton India Club, uh, uh, we really extend a hearty welcome to you in the U.S. and to Philadelphia and to Wharton. And we'd like, as a token of, as a humble token of appreciation, we'd like to present you a small uh, uh, shawl and a gift here.